Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Oh man, it sounds like uh, we had a tough time this week. We're out of breath already. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. You know, I'm grateful to the Lord for a lot of things. First and foremost, life and this opportunity to gather with freedom to worship His name. And I thank Him because there, there, isn't, there isn't like a, a quota you know, where it's like, you must meet this number of people before God's presence can come into this place. And so whether it's a single person, whether it's a small group gathered here, or whether it's the enormous congregation that is meeting right now at Camp Yava Pines for our yearly conference, we're grateful that the Lord's presence can be with us no matter where we are. As, uh, as I contemplated and asked the Lord for a message for today, I, I kept going back to a passage that I had worked on long ago, and it, it, it's, it's a message that, that, at time, that I have shared once before, not here, but as, as I contemplated the passage, I, I wondered, Lord, are, are you sure? Um, this, this is a, a, a children's story. I mean, we... This is a short passage, and it's, it's one that, if, especially if you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard it hundreds of times. And I was reminded of conversations I had as, as I was in school with some of my mentors who shared with me two realities about Scripture. The first is that the Word of God is timeless, meaning that no matter where we are in history, it speaks to us as humans. It speaks to our reality. It's not just timeless, though. It's timely. So in our present time, we search scriptures, we seek out God, and it has something to share for our current reality. So not only does it speak to humans throughout history, but it speaks to us directly. And so as I remembered that, I said, okay, Lord, I guess, I guess this is what you want me to share. So before we get into the Word, though, I invite you to bow your heads and we'll have a a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Lord, we need you. And at this time, we ask for you to speak to us. We ask that that you help us put aside our brokenness, help us put aside our distractions, and that despite the messenger, that you speak your word here today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how many of you grew up in large families, but if you did, you know that in, well, even in smaller families, there's always between siblings this friendly or sometimes not so friendly competition. I think Jaden knows a little bit about that, right? There's there's always a little bit of competition going on. Well, that was true in my family. I grew up mainly with a sister. My brother came along much later. And we were always competing for stuff. Okay? And, and she, she was the one that always wanted to keep things honest. Not, not, not to say that I'm not honest. But she was always the one that's like, hey, um, we have to split that slice of cake. Let me pr- pull out a ruler. You measure it and make sure. Sh- and I'm going to watch you and make sure that we get exactly the same amount of cake. You know those people, right? It just <sighs> makes things difficult. But competition also arises when you have friendly games, right? There's, whether you're playing cards or whether you're playing board games, that's when the real competition comes out. And so for us, the game that brought out, if you could say, the worst of us was the game Monopoly. Okay, we're not allowed to play that game anymore uh, because it, 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 it causes problems or and my wife doesn't like that because she didn't really get to grow up playing Monopoly very much. So she's like, we'll play Monopoly. And I'm like, uh, if we want to remain married, no. Okay, because though we, are, we attempt to be good Adventists, the only Adventist thing that occurred while we were playing Monopoly was that our words were Christian, although maybe, maybe you know, name-calling, we might not say that that's really Christian. And there was a Bible in the room, usually. That's about as Adventist as we could get with the game Monopoly. Okay, And some of you might relate a little bit to that. Well, 
another writer speaking of his experience playing board games as a child. Mark Lee, L, or sorry, Mark L. Strauss is his name. He talks about another game that also caused a lot of problems in his family. And you might know this one, the game of Risk, right? Risk. And he describes how his family worked around this game. And ultimately, he summarizes his experience by saying, the game Risk, and for me, the game Monopoly, taught me and my family that we live in a dog-eat-dog world. It's a food chain. We're always at each other, right? There's always some kind of competition or battle going on. And so as we reflect, consider that there are quite a lot of battles that we're possibly going through right now. They might be interpersonal, right? There's definitely no battles going on in marriages. Definitely no battles going on amongst friends, amongst family. Oh, I might not. Might not be the case. There are. There are, right? Whether, where there are two people gathered together, ideally the Spirit of the Lord is in that place, but there is bound to be some kind of conflict. But we don't, the crazy thing is we don't even need people to have conflict. We'll have conflict within ourselves, right? Do I uphold my moral standards? How do I combat this reality that I am living in? How do I combat anxiety, depression? Let's take it a step further than that. We also encounter spiritual battles on a daily basis. So how do we go about confronting these realities where battles, where confrontations are bound to take place? Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, there is a well-known, well-beloved children's story that I think applies to this kind of reality that we live in, in a day to, on a day-to-day -day basis. We're probably going through Many of us going through it, you're probably thinking of a situation right now. Well, I invite you to open your Bibles or Bible-capable devices to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 5. And as soon as I said that, you probably already know where we're going. Joshua, chapter 5. And we're just going to look at three verses this morning. Verses 13 through 15. We'll read them in their entirety. We'll then do a little bit of a recap summary of how we got to this place. And then we will see what this passage has to tell us about confrontation, about warfare, specifically spiritual warfare. But it can be, it can be applied to all kinds of struggles, whether external or or internal. If you can give me an amen when you're at Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. All right, that tells me that we're ready to go. All right, so the Word of God says as follows, chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us? Or are you for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We generally look at this passage. It's a wonderful children's story. We have the imagery of Joshua by Jericho with an imposing divine figure in full military garb in the presence of Joshua. And we look at that story and we say there's two things happening here. First, there's a little bit of a mirror uh, imagery with the sandals being removed, and then there's the presence of the first physical manifestation given to us through Scripture of one of the first of Jesus after the fall of humanity. 
And then once we've stated that, we jump right to, and Joshua fought the, I'm not going to sing it, but, uh, and Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. They went around, right? They sang, they shouted, and the walls came tumbling down. That's generally how we look at that story. Now, there's this, this point right here. Generally, if you look at your Bible, your, the, the little... Uh, you get right at the beginning of chapter 6. That that's where we start looking at the fall of Jericho. When in reality, the fall of Jericho starts right here in verse 13. There's something very special that happens here. But first, we must look at what has happened before. What got us to this place? Well, we know that the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. God sends Moses, delivers them from slavery. They go into the wilderness. Because of their sin, they last there 40 years. And ultimately, God does fulfill the promise that he has claimed to his people, saying, I will give you the land of Canaan. And so Joshua takes on this role of leadership. Joshua is going to be the one that leads them into the conquest and eventually the habitation of the land of Canaan. There's some, some very important things that happen right before this story. Three things specifically. The first thing is once Joshua has sent the spies out, they come back saying, listen, Joshua, the people are scared. We're going to be able to take Jericho. Three very important things happen. The first is that they cross the Jordan River. Now, we should state very clearly that they don't just cross the Jordan River there. There's a, a, a bit of other important information there. They cross the Jordan River on dry ground. That, again, is a reminder of what they had done 40 years prior. They enter the promised land on dry ground through, Jericho, uh, through the Jordan River at, to begin this process when to exit Egypt, they had finished that process by crossing the Red Sea on dry ground. Following that experience in Gilgal, they do two things. They dedicate the firstborn, something that they did right before the crossing of the Red Sea, and they partake of the Passover, the very first thing they do in preparation to leave Egypt. Two bookends to say, all right, my deliverance is here in Egypt, and a reminder that my promise is fulfilled in the holy, in now in Canaan, two book ends, and so as they are in Gilgal, this city adjacent or next to Jericho, we find our leader, our hero Joshua, and notice how the passage starts. We're we're going to kind of dissect this piece by piece. Verse thirteen, the very first part of this tells us when Joshua something's about to happen, but notice Joshua's condition. He was near Jericho. The first question, I, I'm a questioning person, the first question I asked as I looked, was, what is he doing there? And the logical train of thought is to say, well, he's a warrior, he's a commander, he's probably, if we're going to use modern day language, has a little notepad, pencil, pen, and he's, he's taking down, okay, the, they got that many guards at the gate, they have, uh, well, that wall looks a little bit weak, um, their rotations happen every three hours. Uh, Rahab's position is here. We promised her that we're going to keep her safe. Right? It's all the preparations that need to take place before you go to war. Any person that has been uh, a part of war will tell you to go into war unprepared is to seek out failure. So, inevitably, we can come to the conclusion Joshua was probably making some sort of preparation. But that's not the only thing that he was doing. The key to what Joshua was doing additionally to the war preparations comes in the following portion of the passage, which tells us that he lifted up his eyes and looked. Now to us, that seems, well, we tend in the West at least to read Scripture quite literally and just kind of go piece by piece. And so when we read that, Joshua was near Jericho probably making war preparations. 
And he lifted up his like, whoa, hey, there's a person here that is at, coming to me in full uh, war, uh, in, in full gear, and he's ready for battle. That's how we generally read that passage. But we have to remember that the writers of Scripture are removed from us. When they use language, there's usually other things embedded in that language. And so the act of looking up is not simply, hey, I noticed something in the corner of my eye. I better go take a look. There's something deeper than that. And so let's look at one particular passage that shows us what this action of looking up could possibly mean. Let's go to Genesis chapter 43. This is the story of Joseph. Genesis chapter 43. Now, at this point, Joseph is in Egypt. He has gathered up as much of the good harvest in preparation for the famine. His family has been essentially ravaged by this famine. They don't have any food, so they go to Egypt not knowing that the brother that they had cast out is there. And Hopefully we know enough of the story to remember there's several interactions between Joseph and his brothers, and they do not recognize who he is. And he asks something very special of them. Bring my brother Benjamin. He didn't bring him. Well, he doesn't tell him my brother Benjamin. But he says, bring, you have another brother, don't you? Bring him here. And so notice verse 40, sorry, chapter 43, verse 29, says as follows. Sorry, I was in verse uh, in chapter 34. We are in chapter 43, verse 29, which says, And he, speaking of Joseph, lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. Notice, there has been time between the last time he saw Benjamin, his brother. And so when we read this passage, we can understand, well, the act of looking up has to do with viewing something with desire, with love. Sometimes that desire is not always a positive desire, as if we also look at the story with Joseph and Potiphar's wife, she cast her eyes up or she looked up and she desired Joseph. So there's two, diff so there's, there's two different ways to look at that. Either he's looking with love, as jo Joseph did to his brother Benjamin, or we look at the lustful desire of Potiphar's wife towards Joseph. Now, we could say yes, because it's a promised land, that as he's looking up, Joshua is saying, yeah, I, I desire to, to be in this place. But I challenge you to think that there's something much deeper happening here. So let's turn to yet another instance where this phrase is being used in the book of Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14 and then we're going to go to Deuteronomy. We're going to look at two passages here. Chapter 14, this is the initial steps to the crossing of the Red Sea. Chapter 14, verse 10, which says as follows. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. What happens after they lift up their eyes? They seek the Lord. As they lift up their eyes, they say, Lord, we need you right now. The action of lifting up the eyes is not just one of seeing or looking. It's not just one of viewing something with desire. It is also one that tells us, hey, Worship is about to happen, or worship has just happened. Another passage that shows us this is Deuteronomy, where God tells them, do not lift up your eyes to worship creation. When you lift up your eyes, worship the only God of creation. So as we read through Joshua's story, we notice that something very interesting is happening here. Yes, quite possibly, he is doing things in a preparatory manner. He's preparing for war, but he's doing so in a spirit of worship. He is worshiping God as he is doing that. If we remember earlier in his 
called to ministry. In Joshua chapter 1, we, we remember the famous passage, be strong and very courageous is what the Lord tells them. But he also tells them, keep your, my word, my law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Do not depart from it and I will give you great success. Here we find a warrior who understands this initial battle, this first battle in the promised land is an important one. I need success. I'm not calling out to God because I want my success, but because he's promised. I am claiming a promise of his. And so we find a warrior who is doing his due diligence, preparing for battle, but doing so in a spirit of worship. Let's be real for a moment now. When we encounter difficulties, when we encounter a battle in our own life, whether it be interpersonal, personal, or spiritual, what is our first response? In an era where it's all about me and it's all about fast, 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 fast food, fast cars, fast internet, Quick interactions because I don't have enough time. Our reaction is not one generally. And I'll speak up for myself first and foremost. My reaction is not generally one of worship. Is how can I solve this problem? How can I get out of this difficult situation? A mentor pastor of mine once put it this way. He asked his congregation, how, how long do you spend eating every single day? And Someone from the congregation was like, I eat three times a day. I spend about 20 minutes. I mean, that's, I, I eat rather quickly. And he says, you spend a, an hour every single day making sure that you are physically fed. And then he asked the difficult question. Are you ready? How long do you spend being spiritually fed every single day? Joshua recognizes this need. I need to be connected to the source of power. If God's promise is going to come true, I cannot deliver the pe I cannot deliver Jericho to the people on my own. I need God's presence. I need him. I need the great deliverer. He has already delivered us. He's already saved us. He's proven that. I need that power. I need him to come through. I can't do it on my own. We find Joshua the diligent commander in the heart, with a heart of worship. When struggles come, is our reaction one of worship? That's the first question. Notice what happens. Let's continue exploring this interaction between Jesus and Joshua. In chapter 5, we left off halfway through verse 13, which continued saying, he saw a man with a drawn sword. This happens two other times in the Old Testament. The first is prior to this experience, and it's with Balaam. All right, you remember another great, wonderful children's story, Balaam's donkey, right? Uh, we use that as a story to say, hey, children, listen to the voice of God. You do not want donkeys coming telling you what to do. Right? But we see another figure here with sword drawn in hand. We actually see this, I think, three times altogether. We also see it at the Garden of Eden. And then finally, we see this in David's story where his, the sin he has committed has brought upon judgment over the people of Israel. Whenever we see this figure, judgment is right around the corner. In all the other instances, aside from this one, it is a, a judgment against the people of God because they have done something that they were not supposed to be doing. They weren't supposed to eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Balaam is a priest. He's supposed to be blessing the people of God, and he has been tasked with doing quite the contrary to that. And David, uh, engaging in sin, should have known better than to do that. And so in each of those instances, we see that judgment comes, but in this case, judgment is not for the, against the people of God. It is for them. God's presence is manifested because Joshua is seeking out the Lord. You'll remember that passage from Jeremiah. Seek me, 
and ye will find me because you have sought me with all your heart. This wasn't one of those instances, and we, sorry, let me speak first person. I do this quite often. I'm out the door, Lord be with me. I got a lot of stuff to do today. I get in the car, Lord help me because these Arizona drivers are kind of crazy. People that laugh know that that is true. Okay? Lord be with me because this coworker, this student, this uh, person at the register is frustrating me. Right? Little, little, short little prayers. Hey, Lord, I... but that's not what Scripture and especially the story with Joshua is telling us. There is a continual seeking out of the Lord. Worship starts with an initiation and being deliberate about saying, Lord, I need you right now. And when that happens, Joshua's greatest hope is manifested. He doesn't know that yet, but the very presence of God is in his midst. And I know that if we were in similar situations and we all of a sudden saw the manifestation of God in our lives, we would say, all right, God's got it. We're good. I don't need anything else. But that's where, when our faith needs to, we need to take in that extra step of faith. Though we see these interactions happen in Scripture, and, but we do not see that happening in our life, we have to have that assurance that you know, God has done this for His people in the past. He can continue to do that for us as well. We may not see it, but I know in faith that He is with me. Being intentional about engaging in worship is the first step of winning any great battle. And as we engage in battles every single day. The question is, how often do we need to do this? To Joshua, the command was, meditate on the Word day and night. Every day, we have this necessity to seek out our Creator. From Genesis to Revelation, the theme throughout Scripture is one, well, there are many themes, but one of the biggest themes is that of worship, of genuine wholehearted worship. How do we worship when we encounter difficult situations? Do we worship? A lot of internal, personal questions that we're not going to be answering, hopefully, out loud. But it's not enough to just, or I, I shouldn't say it's not enough, it does not end with seeking out God and being intentional about those interactions. Because we see that God interacts with several people and they do not answer the call. They do not answer the call. But let's look at what Joshua's reaction is to recognizing that it is God who, has, uh, who is with him at this time. So, uh, verse, end of verse 13, And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us, and, or, are you for our adversary, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, no, I am a commander of the army of the Lord, and I have come. The thing that he does right after this, it says, and he fell on his face. He fell on his face and worshipped. Okay? And now, Joshua doesn't begin talking, though. We expect the Joshua to say, hey, Lord, this is what I'm seeing. I'm noticing these strong fortifications. These walls are tall. They have many, many very large, muscular Pastor Ryan looking guards, right? They're just like muscles upon muscles. You know what I'm saying? You've seen those people online, right? It's like, or you've seen that SpongeBob thing where he's like goes to the gym and he's got like a muscle, a tiny little muscle, but then he like, it's just these, these guards are huge. Lord, how are you going to? No. Notice that that's not Joshua's reaction. He says, he bows down in worship and then he says, what do you have to tell your servant. We expect that in worship, everything is active. There is something that needs to be done, but before engaging in action, there needs to be active, active listening. We do not, we cannot know God's will unless he reveals it to us, unless he shares that with us. And notice, earlier I said our, our desire when we have confrontations or or, or difficulties is, okay, let's go. Let's just get, let's get in front of this. But Joshua's, Joshua's response is, I'm going to worship, and then I'm going to say, Lord, I'm going to listen. It's the Samuel experience. 
Lord, here is your servant. It's Isaiah's experience. All the prophets, Jeremiah, Lord, I am here. Speak to your servant. It's a spirit of humility with the kind of society that we live. Humility is, is really hard to come. Because what, what, what are we taught? Hey, your feelings matter. I mean, they do, but it's you, right? It's, it's like all about you. You figure it out. You can do it on your own. Joshua turns that around and says, no, 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 no. I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen. Scripture, God himself has asked me to listen. There's a few passages that remind us that, a, that one, a, someone who listens is quite wise. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2, making our ear attentive to wisdom and inclining our hearts to understanding. Our whole purpose is one of communion, and in communion, there has to be not just communication, but also listening. Very important part of communication, or so my wife tells me. Okay? For those of you that are married, you know this. Okay? If, if I just sit there, and my wife says stuff, and I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. And I'm sorry, because I have done that before, right? Uh-huh, yeah, okay. And then five minutes later, she can't come to check. Why aren't you doing the thing that I asked you to do? Oh, some of the men are like, ooh, yep, I, I know that feeling, right? Why haven't you done the thing that I've asked you to do? What are we lacking there? It's skills for listening, right? Or, you know, we're, we're, we finish the thing that we're doing and we, we finally take that seat, right? We're like, oh, we're good. And then, like, as soon as our rear touches that cushion, it's like, oh, but I also need you. Oh, okay. Listening. Listening. Being an active participant in communion means that we listen and we're open with humility. We say, yes, I can serve you in this way. And so that's what Joshua's reaction is, is, Lord, what shall you have your servant do? And what God asks him to do is, is, is quite peculiar here. Notice what God is, asks him to do in verse 15. He says, and the Lord and the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet. For this place that you are standing on is holy. This gives us Moses and Mount Sinai imagery. Right? To me, it reminds me of uh, my first, well, I guess not my first, my only trip uh, with my wife to India to visit her family. We were still dating at the time. And uh, I got to meet her, her entire family. The thing that they do with their vacations is they don't really have vacations. They do evangelistic tours. And so I was like, hey, you want to do this with my family? And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yes. Because in my mind, I'm like, this, this is someone who I want to marry. And this is, I need to be involved in, you know, with the family. So yes, I want to do this. And I love the Lord, right? I'm trying to, to become a pastor at the time. And I'm so, so yes, let's do it. And so something that I had learned about Eastern culture from uh, various other interactions in my past, which we integrated into our family, is the removing of shoes before you go into the home. Okay? But upon traveling to India, the one thing, the, the thing that surprised me was that this is done before you go into church also. And so I asked my father-in-law, my wife, girlfriend at the time, was like, yeah, you know, find reasons to talk to my father. I, I want you guys to really get to know each other. So I asked him, he's a pastor, and I asked him, hey, um, what's the significance behind, you know, the removal? I mean, I understand in the house, you know, the, the, there's several reasons. You don't want to track in dirt. Uh, you want to maintain a level of cleanliness. Why a church? And so he begins to explain to me and says, Jonathan, it's, it's, it's a matter of humility and respect. We want to honor God in everything that we do. And then he points to, to this passage. And he says, you know, you know why he does this? Why he, God asks him to, to remove his sandals? But he does that to Moses too. But do you know why he does that? I said, well, no, I, I, I'm, I don't know. And he says, it's to let go of the pride. 
when you enter God's presence, he's asking Joshua, let go of your pride. And I did a little digging. The sandal was a very important piece of clothing, an article of clothing. If we went back into Abraham's story, when he enters the land of Canaan, God tells him, everywhere you tread your sandal, that land is yours. That land will be your people's. It's also a symbol of ownership in Scripture. In fact, in Joshua chapter 1, if you turn with me there, verse 3 gives us that same indication. Verse 3 says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give it to you just as I promised to Moses. It's a symbol of ownership. But as my father-in-law reminded me, it's also a symbol of remove, or releasing our pride. God is telling Joshua, hey, listen, I know that I promised this land to you, but this land belongs to me. The, crea my, the creation that you see, that belongs to me. We look at Genesis 1 and 2. He's the creator. Every, and I share this uh, probably too many times, but an artist will sign their creation. They're not going to let anybody else sign their, 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 their painting, right? He's saying, this is mine. I am giving it to you. Let go of your pride. Be humble. Remove the sandals from your feet. Yes, they mean ownership. If you stand on that ground, that means you own it. But no, I need you to understand, this is my land. This is my gift to give. I have promised it, but only I will give it. You will not obtain this on your own. On top of that, He is saying, Joshua, I need you to trust me. I need you to trust. I need you to repent. That's what we call the letting go of the pride. I need you to repent and obey the things that I will tell you. In the following verses in chapter 6, he's going to detail to Joshua, these are the things that you need to do to conquer the city of Jericho, the most fortified city in the land. If you do that, you will be victorious. Repentance and obedience follows active listening. If we obey, we are merging with God's will. By, remove, by being humble, by removing our pride, we are aligning ourselves with God's will and saying, Lord, I want to be used by you. And the passage closes quite simply. It doesn't tell us, and Joshua removed his sandals and continued. No, it says Joshua did. He did exactly what God asked him to do. And just like with listening and with initiating worship, Scripture has a lot to say about repentance and obedience. We look at James chapter 4, which says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands your sins, and purify your hearts. A call to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but it, He is patient towards you, not wishing that any of you will perish, but that you shall reach repentance. And then finally, John 14.15, another well-known passage, If you love me, help me out here, keep my commandments. In the face of struggle, in the face of opposition, in the midst of battle, three things that we can take from Joshua's experience. Worship is a must. And we must seek out the Lord with all our heart. Second, we need to listen to God's voice. We like to be, you know, that, that lone ranger who's just going to go and do things. That, no, God, we listen. He will speak. Remember I said God's word is timeless and timely. He will speak to his word. And then finally, active listening requires repentance and obedience. But what happens when we don't have these elements? What can we expect when these elements are not present? Could Joshua also have gone through a situation where these things did not happen? Well, you'll remember that after Jericho, or after the events of the conquest of Jericho, a man by the name of Achan, 
takes things he was not supposed to. He takes them back to the camp. After that experience, there's another town that needs to be taken over, the city of Ai. So join me in chapter 7, and let's see if this experience has anything to share with uh, us in terms of how to combat or how to prepare for battle. Chapter 7, verse, we'll start in verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people. Now they're preparing to engage with another battle, another town, another war. And notice what Joshua's response is. Joshua sent men to, from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land, something that they had done with Jericho. And the men went up and spied out Ai. Verse 3, And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go, but let about two or three thousand of the men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. They're about to engage in another battle. The response, just like it was earlier, saying, let's go check it out first, and then we'll regroup. Once regrouped, they say, hey, Joshua, it's time for action. But we don't need everybody. I is such a small town. They don't have a whole lot of people. Just take a small, but you need to take action. Take action now. He does not do what he did before Jericho. We'll continue reading. Then Joshua, oops, sorry, verse, verse 4. So about 3,000 of the men went up from there, from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far, of, as, far as Sheriff Shebarim and struck them at the descent, and the hearts of the people melted as water. I thought the city of Ai was outnumbered. I thought Israel had the tactical advantage. What is the difference between the two instances here? Does Joshua and the people engage in committed worship to God? No. Just like us, the reaction is, hey, it's time to act, let's act now. They do not listen for God's voice. Otherwise, God would have told them, hey, there is something that you need to rectify in your camp before you go off to war. And finally, there's no, well, there hasn't been repentance because they haven't sought out the Lord, and there is an obedience. Now, do you see that the I story tends to be our story? That tends to be our reaction, and I've mentioned it a few times. When troubles come, it's, what can I do to get ahead of them? What can I do to get this done and out of the way? Jericho's story and this interaction with the commander of God's army is a reminder to a people who are heavenly engaged in spiritual warfare. If you are to be successful, you need to seek God out first. We cannot continue doing things in the old way. We cannot continue relying on simply our own strength. The prophets will tell you, young men will grow weary. The strong will grow weary, but those who put their trust in the Lord, they will soar. They will rise. We do not do these things in the fashion of this Jericho story because we seek only success. It's because we recognize that without God, we are empty. And so Joshua's lesson becomes one of, I need to be attached to God. I need to be in communion with God. I need to be one with God and he will see me through. Now, you're probably asked, probably wondering, well, yeah, we've heard this, especially if you've been a Christian or an Adventist for all your life. Yeah, we've heard this all our life. Well, sometimes, as I have learned in my teaching years, it's good to have a reminder. 
And as I searched through my heart this week, I looked at the story and I said, I, there's so many times where I'm the Joshua of I and not the Joshua of Jericho. And you may be in that same situation. You're saying, yeah, as I'm reflecting on my life now, I'm the Joshua of I. I'm not the Joshua of Jericho. Well, the beauty of this is that we serve a merciful and loving God. He does not let our, our failures of I become our identity. Joshua goes on to lead the people. He seeks God out. He waits and listens for his voice, and he repents and he obeys. And so when we reach the end of Joshua's story, we see that the thing that God had promised him, you will give the people the promised land because I will give it to you. That promise becomes a reality in Joshua's life because he learns from his life. How long will we continue do, doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result? Without God, we will continue to see failure. We may not recognize it right away, but with God, several passages in Scripture will tell us all things. God's ultimate goal and purpose is that we make it to the promised land. Do you desire to be in the promised land with him? Joshua's response was a resounding yes. So that at the end of his ministry, he said, my house and I, we will worship the Lord, there is no question. I am dedicating myself and I am dedicating my house, my family, my belongings so that everyone will know I serve a great and mighty God. There will be no wavering. My faith may waver, but my God will. He will see me through. Our response now is one of which side of the fence, which side are we going to take? There is no sitting this out on the fence. I will either dedicate my life and the life of my family, the life of my loved ones, and say, we will serve the Lord. I will seek him out. I will listen. And I will obey. Or, with great pain, God will hear us say, I do, I do not choose that. That is not my reality. He will say, I never knew. If we are here, it's because we've already made that decision to say, God, I, I want to know you. But it's one that we can't just make lightly or make once and say, we're good for the rest of our life. Joshua had to make that choice every single day as a leader. Now, you may not be the pastor of this church, you may not be an elder, you may not be a deacon, but you are a leader in your family, big or small. You may be the smallest in your family. You may be Isaiah, but you're a leader in your home. You can say, my house, my heart, it belongs to the Lord. And I want the promise of an eternity with the Creator that gave me life. If that is your desire, as, you, as I pray, say, God, I, I haven't been great at doing this. Many times I have been that Joshua of I. But I want to dedicate my heart, my family, everything that is within me, I want to dedicate it to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your, your word speaks to us and it reminds us that you desire to provide and you desire to walk with us every single day. And as the loving God that you are, you do not force us into such relationship. But you are ever so present, ever ready to take that step next to us. 
Lord, we ask for forgiveness as we, as I, have often been quick to act, slow to listen, slow to repent, and slow to obey. We ask that you, day by day, transform our hearts, that we may seek you out with all our heart, that we may listen to you, we may discover you in a new light, that we may discover your will for our lives and in the process that we may repent and obey. That we may walk with you every day of our life. And that that walk leads us to eternity with you. Lord, I know I'm not alone in this prayer. And many here, as Joshua, would like to proclaim, my house and I, we worship the Lord. Let that be a reality for us every day.